Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church. Let's begin with a time of song as we prepare uh, to hear God's word together. And we're going to start with uh, a song we've grown to love really quickly here. Two, three, oh, you're right. Confess to him and know that we will find mercy as we sing this. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and Son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. God so loved. God so loved the world. Praise God.
trust him? Do we trust his love, his power that he's got us? We're going to sing a song I know it was really popular some time ago and I think it's really appropriate for us to sing it this time about us trusting him when he leads us.
Father, we do trust you. We trust you because your son has shown us we can trust you. No matter what valley we walk through, no matter what storm we're going through, we see your son who went to the cross for us and has risen again, and so we trust you. We trust you because you've sent your Holy Spirit to us, and you are leading us, and you are guiding us, and you have spoken those words over us that we are your children, that we belong to you, that we are not alone. You've given us your peace. You've shown us your love. And so we trust you. Forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So before I invite the kids up to the front for our kids' time, we're going to have uh, some of our announcements. I think we need to bring the headset down just a bit. We have Easter services on Good Friday. Good Friday. That's the day when we remember that Jesus died for us. We walk 
those Stations of the Cross together as a congregation. I'm not sure if the Catholic Church will be doing the Stations of the Cross. If they are, we'll be joining them in that. But uh, be here 10.30 on Friday, March 29th. And then Easter Sunday, we're going to have our big celebration, of course, that Jesus rose again. And there will be a dinner to go with that on the evening of the 31st, 5.30. You can sign up in the back just bring a dish. It's a wonderful way to do a large meal because you only have to do one dish and do that one dish well, and everyone else does one dish, and we don't end up with a fridge full of leftovers. Am I right? You know I'm right. It's the best way to do those dinners, so come and join us for that. Fellowship Junction has been running. That's our drop-in center for parents and children downstairs. I've been watching it this week, and it's been wonderful to see all the kids and parents coming and uh, to see Sonica uh, spending the time with the kids there. We are still looking for some more volunteers to help out with that, and uh, also some substitutes to uh, take on uh, shifts that, you know, may not... uh, Sonica's, of course, expecting, so we will need uh, a bit of help there as as she goes through those stages. Um, Easter dinner. No, I've already got that. Spring cleaning will be March 9th to 13th. There will be opportunities to clean and organize our church. And there's also a spring cleanup at Lake Else Pentecostal Camp. And that'll be on May 11th. I'm planning on being there, going out to that, and being a part of it. We use the camp. We enjoy the camp. And, of course, we're having our family camp there on the May long weekend, which will be the next weekend, May 17th to 20th. So put that on your calendars. Be sure to sign up up for that. Man, we got a lot on the announcements today. We have a couple's date night coming up. If you are married, you are living common law, you're in a serious relationship and you want to, you know, get some counsel on how to do it right, we're going to have a fun date night at Arabisk Restaurant on April 10th. Note the change there, Wednesday, April 10th. And uh, I will share with you one of the things that I share with every couple I do counseling with. It's one of these lessons we've all got to learn. And so um, we'll have some fun with it. We'll play some games. We'll eat some food. And there will be something there for you to talk about with your partner as you go from that place. So be sure to be a part of that. Um, We don't want you to miss that. And so you can sign up, I think. If it's not in the back, just send an email to office at prfellowship.ca to sign up for that. Finally, our programs youth group is going to be off for the spring break. We'll see if we can do something, though, okay? Just give me some time to get that figured out. Back from a big, big trip. Seniors Bible study, of course, Thursday. Community prayer, Thursday. Uh, men's fellowship, Thursday. Mums meet. Uh, we'll not be meeting for the remainder of March. And Julie's asking for others who would consider being a part of that ministry. Nursery is available downstairs, but Sunday school is not today. So we will have sheets for the kids in the foyer, I think, you can pick up. And with that, all those announcements. Did you get them all? If you didn't, go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, because it will all come to you in the newsletter this week. So be sure to do that, prfellowship.ca. And with that... I'd like to invite kids up to the front. Bring me something. We're going to do a mystery box so you guys get the gist of the message, and we'll see what we can do here. Any kids want to come up to the front? Any kids want to come on up to the front? And bring me something. Bring me anything you want. Any kids today? Oh, I think we got shy kids today, so we're going to let it go. Okay. (laughs) That's good. That's just fine. So with that... Kids, there are coloring sheets in the back. If your mom or dad want to take you to the back to get a coloring sheet, you can do that. And we're going to transition now to a time of prayer. Let's go to God in prayer right now. Thank you, God, so much for these songs that were shared with us by these artists that so express your love for us. And Lord, we just want to say today that we trust you. We trust you. And we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for all of our sins, guide us into the world that we live in that is not characterized by love. Lord, may we overflow with it. We think, Lord, of the hostilities we see around this planet, and it can feel so foreign and so far 
and difficult for us to make an impact, and yet we see the same spirit of conflict around us, and even the same, even the same conflict within us. So, Lord, we ask that today you would quiet our hearts by your love. Speak to us with your peace, that we might be a people of peace, that we might be peacemakers just like your son. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you will speak to us so that we can overflow with the words that you've given us, the heart you've given us, and your love, and be peace in our workplaces, peace in our homes, peace in our relationships, peace in this community. And Lord, we pray that in that miraculous way that only you can do and we, can, we can't understand, that you would even use us, Lord, to bring peace here on earth. And we thank you for the gift of your Son again and the word that you've given to us, the word that shows us who you are and how we can follow you. So we ask that you would speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been working through a book of the Bible called Romans, and uh, it's a, an amazing book where Paul, uh, one of the apostles, uh, gives perhaps the most organized uh, presentation of Christian doctrine and Christian teaching and uh, what it, you know, how it ties with the Old Testament and the New Testament together and how it all centers on Jesus. And so the very heart of this gospel is about how God has revealed to us his salvation. So I'm going to ask you just to go down one slide there. I see he's adjusting the camera, so I got our camera guy doing two things at once. But uh, we have, yeah, just one slide down, just so I can see what we got. Yeah, we have gotten to a point in the book of Romans where we are now looking at the new way that God has called us to follow him, which is the way of the Spirit. Not following God by rules and regulations, by religious requirements, but instead following him as he leads us by the presence of his Holy Spirit, who is given to us, poured out into us, who have called on the name of his Son. The book's theme was captured in the first couple of verses in chapter, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where we were promised in this book that we would hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, everyone who puts their trust in Jesus. For in this gospel, oh, sorry, salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then for the Greek. For in it, a righteousness, a holiness is, re- is revealed that is from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the promise that's in the book, and so today you're going to see that promise again manifested. There is power for salvation, the ability to see a life changed as we come to know God. As I was on a trip this week, uh, we'll go down one more, I had a a fun experience hanging out with my son and his son. There's a picture from Christmas, it's not from the last one. This is me holding my baby while he holds his baby, and you can see how cute and cuddly mine is. He's such a little thing. Um, He was crushing me. Yeah. He's a a thick boy. Um, As we were playing on the carpet, I saw my son uh, tickling his son, Teddy. Emmett was tickling Teddy with his nose, just as I used to do to Emmett. And uh, in that moment, as I watched him do that, and then as we were talking, I had this experience. I hate to get super philosophical on you or mystical. But it was like time and space folded for me in a moment. And I, could, I was back in Hunter Mile House. That was Emmett on the floor. You know? But yet here he was as a man. And it was like being transported back to that time and place when he was a baby. I saw him again in that moment. It was like I was in that moment. And you, now I knew that baby even better. And I knew the man beside me even better as I traveled back in time. And those two moments became one. And then I looked at Teddy, and it was almost as if Teddy grew up in a heartbeat in front of me. And there he was as a young man, tickling his baby boy. And I loved that little baby even more because I saw for an instant the man that he would become. A mysterious thing happened there, and I'm not trying to be too magical or philosophical here, but in that moment, I think God gave me a wonderful analogy 
of what he gives to humans, the ability somehow by our memories and our imagination to travel backwards and forwards in time. I mean, in that moment, as I was there on the carpet, I was able to behold both the past and the future in a single moment. Of course, only by my memories and imagination. And in doing so, I found myself loving my son and my grandson even more, feeling like I knew them even better by beholding their lives from beginning to end. If this is how I felt in that moment, can you imagine how God feels about you when he is the eternal God who is right here with us in the here and now, has walked with us as we pass through time from the past to the future in every single moment, and yet he beholds us from beginning to end because he is also beyond time. He's omnipresent in time. He is with you in your past and with you in your future, even now as I speak of this. And he knows you completely from before and, 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 and what is to come. He knew you before the world was founded. And as I considered this, I imagined the day of my birth when God had already known all. He'd known me through my whole life before I was even born. And what joy he must have felt when I was born. When you were born, he says, ah, finally, there he is. There she is. And he's going to live with us and walk with us for the rest of eternity. And yet he's known us from the beginning. Isn't that a wonderful thing to comprehend? I thought we should begin like this because you're going to find this mystery within the passage we have today. And I want to wrap it around the love of God, that the love of God is at the heart of this and that he knows you completely and loves you with an enduring love. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 30. I, did, I talked about chapter, uh, verse 26 last week, but we need to begin here. It's kind of an important verse. Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, that's us, the holy ones of God, according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become, to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Like I said, there's a mysteries and mysteries in this passage. Chapter 8, such an interesting passage, it contains so much hope, and yet we find ourselves constantly, simultaneously talking about our suffering, hope and suffering intertwined. Today, the theme that I saw in this passage was about spiritual alignment. Spiritual alignment. You can go ahead and flip to that. And when we say the word spiritual or when you come across the word spiritual in the Bible, we are not talking about something just mystical or magical, something ethereal, something that's like, ooh. We're talking about something that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. So when we use the word spiritual, we're talking about something that is of the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And so... This is one of the mysteries that God does, the ministries that God does in our life is that by the Holy Spirit, he aligns us to the will and the heart of God. That's one of the wonders of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. He aligns us to God. First, he does this by prayer. When I say that he does this by prayer, you can go ahead, there's one there. When I say he does this by prayer, what you see it immediately in the first part of this verse where it says he helps us in our weaknesses, presenting to God our groanings. It says he intercedes with us with groanings too, too deep from words. 
Now, as I've read the scholars on this, the opinions on what those groanings are are all over the place. Some think that these are just like magical words or un, un, uh, words you, incomprehensible words. Maybe this is what tongues is about in some spiritual traditions. Maybe this is songs of praises that the Spirit brings up. But as we read about it in this passage, the groanings were first talked about in creation. It says that creation groans as in labor pains. Now, for those of you who have, have, a, who have had a child, mums, were you singing praises in the labor pains? <laughs> no, no, you were not. You were not. You were holy women, wonderful women, but you were not thinking, Jesus, thank you for this. <laughs> And then it says that we share in the labor pains of creation. We ourselves feel the pains of creation. This world feels suffering. It, it groans, and we groan with it. And so if he uses the word a third time, it doesn't suddenly change. The groanings are the same groanings that are happening in creation, are the groanings we're feeling, are the same groanings that the Holy Spirit carries up to heaven so that God hears our heart. Folks, this is such a wonderful news. To know that as we're talking about the alignment of us with God, that God even allows in this passage for our groanings to come first, that he hears us. And there's something so amazing about this, as I reflected on it more this week, that the groanings, that he takes our groanings so that he intercedes, it says, he carries our prayers to God so that our pain is felt within the throne room of God. But it said first, earlier in the passage, that we groan with creation. What that means is you and I, as the people of God, we suffer along with this world so that the sufferings of this world are also not unknown by God. We play a sort of mediatorial or intercessory role as well where we carry the pains of this world. And then those pains that were felt are carried by the Spirit to God. What this means <clears throat> is that we should expect and even hope that within every cancer ward, there will be a Christian who can feel the same pain, who can suffer alongside of those who are wrestling with the fear and the hopelessness, the anxiety, the actual physical pain, and they can suffer beside them, with them, so that their prayers are heard. It means that we should hope and expect that within every AA group, every 12-step program, there should be a Christian who has known the defeat, their own struggles with sin, and has still found hope. And as they groan, they can groan with the rest of the group and carry those as well to the Spirit who carries those groanings to the Father. This is a marvelous thing for us to consider as we think about our own sufferings. But as we go through those sufferings and we are groaning, we don't even know what to say, and the Spirit just takes the sound of our pain and carries it to heaven. But then it says that He also teaches us to pray as we ought because we do not know how to pray. Who's saying this? This is the Apostle Paul who is admitting, I don't know what to pray. And he says, the Spirit teaches us to pray as we ought. i got to tell you how many times I've been blessed when people who have said to me, I don't know how to pray, and then I hear them pray, and I think, wow, that was led by the Holy Spirit. You don't need me to teach you to pray. You can go to God and learn how to pray from Jesus, learn how to pray from the Word, and Learn to pray by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be seeing how that happens even within this passage today. And it says that he searches our hearts and our minds, not just hearing our pain, but searching us entirely. And says that he knows the mind of the Spirit. And in doing so, he is making known to us the mind of God so that we can pray according to his will. So what's happening in this passage, I want you to see, this just at the beginning. When we go to God in prayer, there's an alignment where God hears what you're suffering and he suffers with you. But then he's also, by the Holy Spirit, making known to you his will 
so that you can pray according to his will. So we receive from God his mind. He receives from us our groanings. And there's alignment. Isn't this wonderful to know? This is what's happening in your prayers. As we talk about the will of God, he is not ignorant of where you are and how you have suffered. Now then it says that the alignment we have with God goes beyond just our prayers, but it is also in the promise of God. And as we turn to this next verse, I need to put a massive warning on it. When we talk about being aligned according to his purpose, you can put it up on the screen. The verse that often is quoted and I think is sometimes cruelly quoted and it's not done in a way that doesn't bring comfort is this verse that all things, we know that for, all, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This can sound like when it is said by some that don't worry, it'll all be worth it. Oh, don't worry, you lost a job, God will get you a better job, Right? I mean, if it was just losing a job and getting a better job, that's fine. But some of our pain has no consolation. Losing a child, sorry. You're not going to be able to tell a parent, oh, don't worry, God will give you another one. Right? There's just no consolation. And so do not think that this verse is saying, hey, chin up there, big guy, you'll be okay. God will make this worth it because he hears your groanings and he suffers, his heart suffers with you. So as you, as you hear this verse, do not hear it as a trite word to you. The good that's being talked about here is a good that goes way beyond our perspective, way beyond what we can imagine. It is so far outside of our sight, and yet God's going to show it to us today in part, in sort of a macro way, and there's going to be proof of it, even within this passage, that God can do that. It's the type of good that should get our imaginations just fired up with hope, no matter what kind of suffering we're going through. It is about new creation. It is about God doing something beyond our comprehension, a good that is beyond what we can see. And we can only be comforted by this verse if we truly trust God. It's only if we trust Him that we can embrace that the promise of God for our good is true. I remember sharing this verse as I was thinking on other subjects with Julie, and she was the one that highlighted in this verse the phrase, for those who love God. And I've been thinking about this for months. you got to know this. This has just completely changed this verse for me. You see, if I truly love God, it means that I trust Him, that I know that what He does isn't going to harm me. It's for my good. And I, I may not be able to understand it, but I will Trust him. When the passage says, if we love him, it's not like God saying, hey, I'll do good if you love me. That's not what it is. He says, I'm doing good, but you will see it if you love me. This is not a carrot God is putting in front of us, but it's rather talking about people whose hearts are aligned with God. If we love him, we will agree with him. If we love him, we will love what he loves. We will see how he works, and we will trust him along the way. But if we do not trust him, if we do not agree with him, if we do not trust his purposes, then it doesn't matter what God says about it. If we don't trust him, we will despise him for our sufferings. We will curse him for our pain. There will only be resentment and bitterness, no consolation if we do not trust him. If we trust that he has called us for his purposes and his purposes are good, he has a good plan for us and we can trust him. And this is the mystery that is difficult for us to comprehend, but having been joined together with Christ, there is evidence of this. Let's just take a look at our next slide so I, I know what I'm talking about next. Oh yeah, oh no, good thing I didn't go too far. We see, 
<laughs> we see a mystery described here in this passage, almost like he's talking about our journey with God. That sometime before the foundation of the world, God foreknew us, and then he predestined us, and then he called us, and then after calling us, he made us holy. He forgave us on the, on the, when we believed in Jesus. He justified us. And then there's the promise yet of glory to come. And as we look at the book of Romans, we have to see that Paul has only been talking about this stage of justification, how God has made us right with God, how he's made us righteous. Now, this passage we're looking at today has had endless, endless books written on it um, as people have tried to figure out the mysteries of what Paul is talking about. So I'll explain it to you in about the next five minutes, of course. Um, For those of you who care, the two main... Uh, schools of thought come from a group called Calvinists and a group called Arminians, and I'm going to leave it at that. And really what they're trying to do is trying to understand how can God foreknow and predestine us and us still have free will. Have you ever come across debates like this? Yeah, okay, we're just going to relax. This is why we're going to relax. Paul doesn't explain it. So anything you go beyond what Paul explains here is called philosophical speculation right? Fun exercises, but oh man, you are a 2D person trying to understand us. 17th dimensional God. You know, there's just, there's no, there's no analogy. I tried with, you know, my son and my grandson to give you an analogy, but God's experience of time is so different from our own that um, just relax. When it says that he foreknew us, you can go down one slide here. He actually kind of uses this language in some of his other letters. In Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about how we were chosen before the foundation of the world in hope that we would be in love and that in order that we would be adopted as his children. So being foreknown isn't just that God knew what you would do. He knew you. That's what it means. If you are foreknown, it doesn't mean that he just was able to predict everything you would do. It means that he actually knew you like his child, before you were born, before the foundation of the world. That's the kind of knowledge we're talking about. And when it says that he predestined us, don't think of this as in the terms of fate. When God, he's talking about his foreordination, what God has ordained for us, Paul tells us exactly what God's plan was for us. It's not fate. He says that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's the point that we would look like Jesus. That's what he's calling us to. And so we can try to wrap our minds around the mystery of God and his relationship with time, and I promise you, good philosophers will tell you, you either write a dissertation on this or give up. It's okay. It's okay. Eternity is a big subject. But... When we talk about his foreknowledge and his predestination, do not see yourself as a mere token or puppet in the game board of God's plans. He knows you. That's what it means. He knew you. He knew you. And he had a plan for you that you would look like Jesus. Not as a clone, but that you would have the same sort of glory that Jesus has. Now that's good news, isn't it? You know, what I also love about this is when we kind of go through the book of Romans, Paul doesn't try to logically begin with God's foreknowledge and then predestination and then his call and then our justification because none of that makes sense until we have come to Jesus. None of it makes any sense until we come to Jesus and we call on him. And in the moment that we put our trust in Jesus, He shares with us his future, the glory, but he also shares with us his past, his destiny, his call, all the plans that God had for us, had for Jesus become ours when we trust him. Not only is his future ours, but his past is ours as well. Now that is a mystery. And the idea of being foreknown by God and predestined by God and effectually called by God, these are truths that make no sense 
until you have trusted Jesus and in trusting him, we are tied to him. We are bound to him. And only then does it make any sense at all. So what this means is for those of you who have come to know the Lord Jesus, you are part of an eternal plan laid by a God who knows you completely and loves you. Wow. Yes? Does it make your heart say, wow? I hope I've explained it well because my heart's been just going, wow, all week as I've been thinking about this. <clears throat> but it says we're supposed to become like Jesus. Let's just look at the next slide here. If we're to become like Jesus, how many of you, now you can put up your hands, but let's just do this rhetorically, in your hearts. How many of you look at Jesus and say, yeah, he's good, right? Yeah, I know, it's hard, not to be, it's hard not to wave your hand at that. I'm saying rhetorically, but is he glorious? Think about it rhetorically, because I'm going I'm to come back on you with this answer, with, with your answers. Is he truly good? Is he beautiful? Is he what you want to be like? We, I see nodding heads. But then, folks, how did Jesus, how was Jesus' true goodness, his true holiness, his true beauty and glory revealed to us? How did we come to see it? It wasn't through the miracles. It wasn't through the healings. It wasn't even through the teachings. It wasn't even through the way that he had compassion on the people around him. We saw just how beautiful Jesus was how truly glorious he is when he laid down his life for us. Like that's when we saw the full and true love of God. Chapter 5, verse 8 in this book, God showed us his love in this while we were still sinners. Jesus the Christ died for us. That's when we saw the love of God, when Jesus showed it to us in all of its fullness. Well, then we know that Jesus rose again from the dead, and he is glorified and exalted at the right hand of the Father. And that's a promise that he has for us, right there at the end of the, right there at the, end of the chain there. He's, we'll be glorified. <laughs> but if we're like Jesus, we don't reach glory apart from crucifixion. We don't reach the resurrection apart from death. We don't reach glory apart from suffering. That's how Jesus was manifested. And so if we're to be like Jesus, God is calling for us to be like him in all ways. So if we agree that Jesus is glorious and beautiful and he's who we want to be, then we are agreeing that we are trusting that the same God who raised him from the dead will raise us from the dead. The same God who brought life to his body will bring life to our bodies even as we suffer with him. That the same God who is manifested and glorified, who showed us his love so perfectly in his son, will show that love through us when we suffer like Jesus. That's what we're saying. If we want to be more like Christ, I must be willing to suffer like him. And can suffering make us more beautiful? Can it make us more glorious and good, more like Jesus? And the answer is yes, and I'm going to give you proof. But if you ever tell her that I used her as an example today, I don't know what I will do to you because I'll be so embarrassed because she'll just, she'll, no end to this. I'm thinking of our dear sister, Michelle. Michelle has many trials. If you don't know Michelle, you saw her scooting around town at the light speed in her wheelchair. And despite all the challenges she faced, she was one of the most beautiful people you would ever meet. And I say only in past tense because she's in Newfoundland, right? She's been just living over there. So they get to enjoy her. But she showed us the beauty in suffering because her faith in Jesus never was shaken, right? You've seen that beauty right here. And the opposite is true. Our ugliness is manifested in our sufferings too, right? If we don't suffer well, it manifests our ugliness. So I I flew into Toronto, which if you know what it's like to fly into Toronto from Prince Rupert or Terrace, it means that you arrive at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
Nobody's happy. I'm not happy. And I get off the bus. I get off the plane. I go to get, catch my shuttle to the airport, and the shuttle bus driver doesn't pull in. He just drives right on by. So I got to stand there for a half hour. Can you feel my pain? You can actually not answer this rhetorically. Who can feel my pain? You, those, those of you who travel, come on. Shuttle skips you. You're like, oh, man. I just want to get to my hotel room, right? And I'm mad. And the next shuttle comes, and what do I do? I complain. Oh, that guy skipped me. Blah, 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 blah. I get to the desk. Blah, 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 blah. And just as I'm doing it, I realize, man, you are ugly. You are petty. And so I confess it to the desk. I say, you know what? I'm tired. I'm grumpy. And you know what? That isn't good. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being so petty. You know, I share this in a minor way, but you know how ugly we get. Look at some of your Facebook walls. When we suffer, right, we get ugly. And yet if we look at Jesus, when we're suffering and we trust that our suffering can result in good just as it did in the life of Jesus, well, then I can love him because I can trust him And God can do something beautiful in my life if I will embrace the pain that I'm going through with Jesus. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit then for us, I'm hoping you're still tracking with me because this is all about how the Holy Spirit aligns us to the heart of God. You can go to the next slide here. What he does for us is he teaches us how to pray. Begin with your groanings. If you are groaning, start with it. Start with your groanings and bring them to God. And then let him show you, ask for his glory so that you can see Jesus and trust God's purposes for you. I think about the Psalms. Some Psalms begin like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, that's a nice prayer, right? David's in a good mood that day. And all he can think about is how wonderful God is, and God is wonderful. That's a great psalm to pray many days. But on the cross, Jesus chose David's Psalm 21, which begins with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a valid prayer. That's a great prayer. Because that's his groanings in that moment, and they get carried up to heaven. They are not, you know, ignored. They are heard by God. So whatever place we're in, God, I'm so angry. I could hit someone. I'm not going to. But I feel like that. God, I'm just so mad. Is that a valid way to start your prayer? I want to say, praise God, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. God, I'm so scared. I am so overwhelmed. God, I feel so lost in my depression. God, I don't know if I can beat this. I hurt so bad. Those are all great ways to begin your prayer. Bring them to God. And the Holy Spirit will translate it, and even beyond the words you spoke, He will carry the actual feelings to God Himself. They will be validated. They'll be welcomed there. And as we come to Him and we confess it to Him, He's the one who then can also show us our Savior, who can show us that there is a plan for you, even if you cannot see it. The proof of it is in Jesus. You've seen the proof of it in your life in different times. And he reminds you of this, and he calls you to see God's purposes, shows to you some of the mind of God. This is a ministry only the Spirit can do for us. We can begin with our groanings and then seek his glory. Amen to that. Let's go to God and let's try it right now. Heavenly Father, some of us today are feeling quite hopeless. Some of us today are feeling tremendous pain, and we came despite it. Some are listening online because the pain and the anxiety and the suffering they're going through The depression is actually keeping them from leaving. Some are listening later in this week because they couldn't even do it now. Lord, you hear our prayers. We praise you for this. We want to say how 
how we're, we're so sorry for disappointing you. And we're, we're sorry for our weaknesses. And yet, here we're encountering your love, knowing that you hear these groanings, you hear this pain. Thank you. Help us, Lord, in our weaknesses. Teach us how to pray. Lord, I can't imagine what you're doing in my life right now. I can't imagine what you're doing in our lives as we go through this. I can't imagine... I can't imagine how this is good. And yet, you've shown me, you've shown us all, how you can bring about your glory in the darkest places. We see it in Jesus. We see it in our brothers and sisters here in this room. We've seen it, Lord, in our own lives too. We forget when the pain comes, but we have seen it. So, Lord God, we want to just confess right now that we trust you. You are good, and your plans for us are good, and they go beyond what we can even imagine as good. As we look at your Son, and we hear you speak those words over us that we are your children, that you have known us from before time began, that you have destined us, predestined us to look like Jesus and to fulfill the call that you have put on our lives. You have made us holy and you will glorify us. Lord, we know that you love us and we trust you. And the Lord, we will follow you through whatever dark valley you call us into. Praising you, trusting you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we uh, sing this next song.
sing the chorus one more time as a declaration of faith. Pour out my heart, say that I love you. Pour out my heart, say that I need you. Pour out my heart, and I'll say that I'm thankful. Pour out my heart, say that you're go from this place. My prayer is that you would know that God hears your prayers and will walk with you and show you his mind. May he do that to you this week. And may you declare with me, God is good. Amen. All right. God bless you folks. Stick around. Say hi to people you don't know because there's a bunch of people here you don't know today. So they're maybe here for spring break. I don't know. I haven't met them all. Don't let them get away. Say hi to them. Hold them up in conversation. Thanks. Thank you guys.